Hello, welcome to the latest episode of Beyond the Talk, where we dig deeper into the conversations that were started at Elevate. Whether it's improving accessibility across the physical activity sector or upskilling the workforce to support the pivot to well-being, it's really important that we carry on these conversations to ultimately drive the industry forward. My name is Paul Swainson. I'm Education Project Specialist at FutureFit, uh, having been in the industry for 20 years, including a stint developing and designing training programs specifically for PTs. This is a really interesting topic for me. We're going to be talking about recruiting and retaining good personal trainers, something which has historically been a challenge for some operators. But luckily, we've got three fantastic guests who are going to bring interesting and varied perspectives to this topic, which I'm very much looking forward to hearing about. So by way of introduction, uh, they'll be able to do a far better job than me. So I'll hand over to Carl first, if you don't mind. Uh, yeah, I'm Carl Richards. I'm the Operations Director here at FutureFit Training. Uh, my background is more around community health and wellbeing, but I have been a fitness instructor, PT, um, and sports therapist as well. Okay. Brilliant. My name is Gavin Baxter. I'm the Head of Business Development for Active IQ. Active IQ is an awarding um, body within the health and fitness sector, specialising within that area. We operate domestically and, and overseas. My background, I've been in the sector for 20 years, started as a sports coach, worked as a um, fitness instructor for British Military Fitness, you might remember them. Uh, was an independent owner as well. I had my own studio and used to do boot camps and then I worked in Saudi Arabia for four years. And now I'm heading up the uh, the commercial division within Active IQ. Thank you. Uh, Richard? Put me to shame here. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm Richard was and I head up personal training at Total Fitness. Got 15 sites, 150 personal trainers. Um, Went through an acquisition of taking our third party PT supplier in house. Uh, so, been through that journey, uh, been a general manager at seven of our clubs and been heading up our, our PT proposition at the moment. Thank you. All right, we'll dive straight in and we'll start at the beginning. So, qualifications and certifications. Uh, Gav, I'll come to you first for this one. Uh, so, which, uh, what qualifications and certifications do you think are essential for personal trainers entering the industry? And also, there's a follow up to that. How do you balance the the, the need for traditional qualifications with emerging trends and specialisation. Brilliant, thank you, Paul. So yeah, I think this is quite a relevant question at the minute because uh, we're going through a reform for the qualification framework. So Active IQ over the last 18 months, as we have done for the last 20 years, but specifically for the last 18 months, because of guided from iFit and Ofqual, we've been engaging with employers and asking them what is it, what skills do they need to see there? And we've been doing an exercise of looking at the old fitness instructor qualification and personal training qualification, which is the entry qualifications into that sector, and looking at do they need to change? Is there aspects of that that, uh, that is relevant still? And as you can probably imagine, there is a need to change in some areas. So we have been a bit more innovative in terms of the way the assessments are done to make sure that when learners are coming into the sector, they're getting assessed in the correct methods. We're looking at stuff that is relevant in terms of soft skills as well. One of the biggest things that came back from employers was um, especially fitness instructors, which is going to be called a, um, a coach, these um, these individuals have to have the skills to be able to engage with people at that um, customer service level as well, which was missing sometimes from the current structures. And we're looking at um, using AI technology and, and development in terms of digital development and things like this for, for learning. And I think additional programs on, on top of that, I mean, we've always had a need to specialise in different areas. So there's always qualifications that are available kettlebells spinning, things like this that are always going to be popular because they're, they're aligned with industry trends around the world, group exercise, for example. But there's also a need for development of leadership and management, like any sector, not just the health and fitness sector. We know that um, people kind of develop through with sometimes missing that gap of uh, leadership qualifications for themselves. They kind of move from a practitioner into a position of management and they don't, um, they don't necessarily know how to manage people other than what they've learned through their own kind of values and beliefs. So I think there's a, there's a need there. And uh, I know Future Fit, you guys have been developing leadership and management programs for the sector, which is brilliant to see. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Uh, and how about yourself, Richard? So for your personal trainers, what, what are the essential qualifications <laughs> that you would look for? Yes. So from an operator, I can judge it by what are our most successful PTs. Um, we always go back to setting up for success is really key and i think what's got to be massively aligned is the job what they're actually there to do in terms of a career when you put them in the real world it's like driving a car mm -hmm. you actually learn how to do it when you get into the real world but how, how can we shorten that gap between doing a short-term qualification to running your own pt business um and you know we've, we've given a bit of feedback on the level twos and level three so it's great to hear that similar operators are doing the same thing which yeah. is uh, the softer skills 
the customer service, the communication skills. Mm -hmm. um, you can have all the skill in the world to be able to deliver PT and be a fantastic PT. You might have a very, very poor PT business. Um, so it's things like sales acumen, uh, communication with your customers, um, even having kind of the work-life balance of being able to prolong your business, not just in the short term, but how do I grow a successful business and continue to grow? Um, so it is a lot around kind of the softer skills, uh, which I think is definitely the biggest opportunity. Uh, I think the level two and level three is, is good. Um, I'd say it's bridging that gap with those softer skills to allow them to, to understand the real world of, of, of PT a little bit. Um, I like what some operators are doing, so I know future you guys are doing it a little bit, which is great, um, is, is bringing people um, that have been successful in PT, that maybe haven't been successful in PT, learning from their stories alongside yep. learning the level two and level three. Mm -hmm. um, if you've got a great idea of what you're walking into, you're setting yourself up for success. Um, I think we as operators have a, um, I, th I think we have to be held to account in, in what we expect from people. Uh, feedback to the to the people, it's supply and, de supply and demand at the end of the day. So essentially what we expect needs to be delivered. Um, so yeah, all around a softer skill, just making it more rounded about a career than just necessarily learning a skill that you're gonna go out there and do. Yeah, I suppose there's an element of, you can never create an initial course that covers all bases and, and bring somebody into the industry who's a done understood finished article it's going to be a progressive continual development process anyway so it's it's about that kind of support through the career as well as the initial course of exactly that and every pt's journey is 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 for them is unique to them they decide where they go with it it's about setting them up for success in the best possible start that they can enjoy the journey hmm. not be pressurized that actually what i've learned isn't actually what i expect it to be I'll move out of the career sector and try something else. Yeah. When actually, I think we can we can get them in there a little bit earlier. Yeah. I think. Uh, Joe, is that cool? No, I think you know. At the end of the day, it, it is those vocational qualifications that we need to think about. You know, it's that standard of level two, level three. But I think beyond that point, it is about understanding their their own career. And whilst they might buy a package of courses at the very beginning, that might be something that they want to specialise in at that point. But it's understanding that actually, I can change my mind. I can go into more specialist populations if we want to, low back pain and things like that. So it, it's definitely about those softer skills. It's definitely about trying to introduce learners to the industry at a sooner point. So it's about having those recruitment days, those education days in operators so they can start to learn about what does it actually mean to work in these facilities rather than just, I'm going to do my course in the next eight weeks and just go out there and see what I can do. Beyond that, it's talking to people like Total Fitness and other operators and actually being in that environment, a little bit like a, a hybrid apprenticeship, but not that. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned special populations there. So we are sort of seeing this shift towards active well-being, mm -hmm. um, and there's a kind of sort of concurrent um, change in the demographic of, of gene users as well. So do the current qualifications prepare PTs to work with those special populations, people with mobility issues, health issues? Um, or again, is, is there more work to be done there? What's your thoughts? Yeah. I think there is qualifications out there that will offer pathways and the, the knowledge that people need within them. I think the, the entry level qualifications when delivered right are going to give people that kind of broad spectrum naturally. But then we can, we certainly have, I mean, we've got Active IQ, we've got qualifications that specialize in special populations, special conditions to support PTs and their, 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 their career as well. We have, we, I see this around the world in terms of like, um, I've had a conversation with, with uh, someone in Australia recently that was saying, one of the biggest challenges they had was PTs engaging with disabled clients because they didn't have the college, uh, the, the confidence or the knowledge to be able to, to do that. And we, as an awarding body, we've got qualifications that, that look at that and, and, and specialize in, in working with disabled clients, for example. Um, and there's not a lot of take up on it. And there's a lot, a lot of take up on it because the question I ask myself all the time is, is it because people are not retained long enough within the sector that they're not developing the career? Or is it just not an interest that's pushed enough? Or what? what is it that's kind of missing at that point? But uh, yeah, there's specialist qualifications in them areas. And I think there's more to be done as well about building awareness around helping PTs and, and help structuring their career into these uh, yeah. as well. Uh, have you seen that, that shift, Richard, within within the gyms in terms of the, what the PTs are working with and the people that are looking for their services? Yeah, I think less so special populations. I think more so general well-being wellness. Mm -hmm. uh, I, think, I think it's so key. I think a lot of our PTs, they, they have what their vision is of being a PT. It's a transformational coach, able-bodied transformational mm -hmm. coach. They, they, have, they know what they want to be able to do. Uh, you've got some of injury prevention and they will seek that education within mm -hmm. that specific area. 
Um, I do think there's you know, some great courses out there that allow you to do that. I don't think it necessarily has to be level two and level three. Um, I think most people are generalists when they start out with a, an idea of what they want to be, but I think everyone has to start out as a relative generalist until they find their niche um, or have enough clientele to be able to do that. Um, yeah, I think more wellness and well-being. Um, I think that comes down to, again, communication. How do you, how do you talk to people about these things? We know that yeah. being a personal trainer is half of it's being a counsellor. Uh, and half of it being a counsellor is around how you effectively communicate to your client when it's not about physical training, uh, where it's about helping their stress levels, um, helping support them at work through relationship issues, actively listening. These softer skills that are so, so important to retaining clients, it's mm. not just about physically training anymore. Mm. Um, with the likes of social media and everything like that, there's so much content out there. Anyone can put a reasonable program together. Um, what a PT does is that they have those softer skills to be able to listen to an individual, find out what they want. Um, and that's often personal. It's sometimes it's not even it's not even related to actual physical, physical activity. So um, that certainly, um, I think what we've actually experienced as well is looking inside of the industry and outside of the industry. Uh, we have a few good examples of, of some of our PTs that have actually uh, done counseling courses to be able to better their PT business. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we can potentially do a bit more of that when it actually comes to PT specific coaching yeah. and in that setting of one hour settings, how does that come across? Is it on the gym floor space? Is it in the cafe? Is it in a safe space? Um, how do we have those things? So yeah, I think a mixture of industry and non industry around wellbeing. Um, but I think in terms of special populations and things like that, do it if you want to do it, don't mm. if you don't. Yeah. I think understand who you are as a PT and what you want to do and seek that education in what you want to do. Yeah, so there are some core skills that would work and be applicable for all clients, um, even though kind of we are looking at more of a wellness space than just specifically fitness. Yeah, um, yeah okay, that makes sense. Um, so, Carl, I know at FutureFit, we've been looking a lot more at the wellness space over the last yep. few years. Um, and it's almost kind of like a redefinition of what, what PT is all about. It's not just about getting a better bench press and running faster and smashing out burpees anymore. There is a much more of a holistic approach to it. Definitely. And, you know, I think coaching is is the word that's being used quite a lot now, you know, we're moving from fitness instructor to fitness coach and our health coaching, life coaching, you know, where you've got that coaching and mentoring aspect to, to a person's job role. And, and we definitely need to look at that. And it does bring those those skills in there, those more conversational skills. I think that's that's more of what we need to look at. Um, just touching on you know, special populations and, and disability, uh, our first beyond the talk was all around inclusivity. And I think you know where you're saying, do that special populations train if you want to do it, don't if you don't want to. I think that's really key because I think there's sometimes a bit of a fear there around disability and that, that inclusivity and people don't quite know how to use the language, you know, what kind of language, what term, term, terminology would you use? I think you know if we can if we can bridge that gap and, and really think about what we're doing there. Um, you now we're working with a disability organisation at the moment to try and bridge that gap with people and trying to make them have more confidence as an instructor, as a coach, but also for that population to to feel comfortable to come into these types of organisations as well. So um, yeah, I think definitely someone needs to pick a direction that they want to go, but holistically. Um, in terms of working inclusivity with, with clients, we're drip feeding that through our level two and level three courses anyway. I think that's a, a brilliant point that you made there just to build on that is um, you mentioned about being a lifestyle coach. We actually had a, a great a great debate um, with our CEO Sophie the other week. Um, it was around what does the future of personal training look like? Um, and there's, what I kind of believe is there's going to be an umbrella under personal training, but under that you have your specialist coaches. I think there's, the marketplace is that big that you can have specialist coaches. So you're going to have your well-being coaches, your lifestyle coaches, uh, maybe your business mentor coaches, your physical training, your specialists, uh, all under the umbrella of PT. Mm -hmm. So I don't think you have to be a generalist anymore. There's so much business out there to be had. Um, oh. I think you can decide if you want to be just a wellness coach, I can be a wellness coach. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I think it's up to operators, isn't it, and organisations to sort of say to each other, look, just because I'm going to specialise in that particular aspect doesn't mean that my client can't go to someone else for that particular part as well. So it's all Absolutely. about organizations bringing their PTs probably yeah. together a little bit more, isn't it? And working more cohesively together. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that, so I think that will come back to something we'll talk about later on in terms of what you mentioned, Richard, about starting off as a generalist, but then eventually becoming a specialist. So people might not know what they want to go into to start with, but if you've got a, a career pathway and a kind of a mentorship program that they can go through and eventually 
they kind of make an educated decision about where they go. Yeah. And that's definitely a kind of a, that's the future. <laughs> um, okay, let's move on to uh, recruitment then. So we, we mentioned earlier on that recruitment of PTs historically has been challenging some operators. Um, and Hotel Fitness have been making quite a few changes recently. So how are you finding recruitment in the current climate? Tough. <laughs> uh, tough in terms of, I think, volume and quality. Quali uh, volume of quality. Uh, we, our recruitment process is, is quite stringent. Um, so we have a kind of five stage process. Um, which, which was good. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, go for it. So our five kind of stage process is we, we would bring them into a one to one um, or ideally a recruitment assessment day where we get to see their values come out. Um, a gym floor engagement task, which is actually going into our sites walking the gym floor and just introducing yourself to a few of our clients. And I think that's really important to go, we we want to make sure that you're the right fit for us, but also we're the right fit for you. So if you're a bodybuilding specialist and you're going into maybe one of our sites like Wigan, who is a very, very small population of bodybuilders, it's got to be right for both. Mm -hmm. You might be the right person, but the business might not be there for you and that's okay. Mm -hmm. So we tie these things out in the recruitment process. Um, we then do a consultation a uh, physical PT delivery session, um, and then a business plan on the back of it. So now you know what you know about Total Fitness. How do you see yourself setting up your business with us? It's their journey, it's not ours. We are mentors, not managers. Um, so that, that's how we run, a, run our recruitment process. Now, they might not tick all the boxes, but that's absolutely fine. What we're also doing is learning about, can we help them with their skills gap along the way? Yeah. So with our education provider with FutureFit, um, with any external partners that we have, such as accountants and things like that, you know, business, commercial activity, things like that. Um, can we bridge that gap? And if we can't, we're probably not doing the right thing by them to have, the, have them in our business, and that's okay as well. Um, so in terms of getting people through the journey, it, it's quite tough, yeah. but our success has been getting better and better and better every year. What we're starting to see is the quality of PT coming through isn't up to scratch, I think. Yeah. Um, in terms of the qualifications might not be the right ones. Uh, they might have been over-promised and under-delivered on in terms of what's expected from a PT. Uh, I think the commercial acumen isn't there for a, for a lot of people. And it is, it's tough being a PT. It's a simple business, but to get it right is tough. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think the, the quality isn't there and the volume of quality isn't there at the moment. Just, just no. maybe touching on that, that point then of, of being the right fit for each other. Do you think as an industry then there is too much of putting bums on seats in terms of PTs and trying to fill your club? Yes. <laughs> um, retention rates, they're always kind of question, is it six months, is it 12 months, the average yeah. length of a yeah, PT yeah. stays in the industry. Um, there's a reason for that. I don't think we're setting people up for success. And I use that phrase because it, it is all about setting people up for success. Mm -hmm. the, the end of their four, five year journey and our retention rates are just over four and a half years uh, with our PTs. Um, it starts at the recruit, well, it starts at the educational phase. Yeah. Um, then we've got to make sure that their education that they have done is right for our business when we're right with the right fit for each other. If we're just putting bums on seats, they're not going to be here in six months time. Mm -hmm. And we become the busy fools um, and we don't have a good reputation after that. If we start churning individuals, we have a great reputation because we onboard the right people that are right fit for us and the right fit for them. Uh, we onboard them 30, 60, 90 day um, onboarding. Uh, with all the education, all the mentorship, and then they will graduate at some point to be the PT they want to be. Um, so it is, we don't have high volume, but it's massively sustainable. So yeah. we've had steady growth over the last three years and I, I, many of our competitors haven't, yeah. Um, yeah. but we've done it with less PTs than mm -hmm. we've ever had before. Okay. Um, so we're good at what we do. Um, so there's, there's just not enough quality coming out of various providers at the moment. Yeah, yeah. Uh, do you know, we've, from the awarding body side, we've seen that. So we're Active IQ, we pride ourselves on the kind of the way that we quality assure the training providers that we work with. So we've got eight full-time EVs that are out every single day, kind of going in, assessing, making sure that the standards are up to where they are. The qualifications are wrote based on employee feedback, based on the, 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 the standards that are set in the country. But I have seen it. We're in, a, we're in a cycle at the minute where we've seen good providers go out of business because the industry life cycle is kind of driven on price. So now if, if you're a consumer, if you're... 18, 19 year old deciding what to do with a career and you're going on Facebook, you're seeing a PT course for four, 500 quid, you're signing up to it and you, you're already, um, you're not getting set up to, you're getting set up to fail type of thing as you'd mm -hmm. say, because because you're right, you'd go into that education then you have to pay extra to get a tutor. You go see a tutor in a Costa coffee shop and it's someone who's not qualified as a tutor and they're just giving <laughs> you a, a Google document. And I've seen all this. We've had, we've had people do secret shops with some companies and 
I've seen an assessment as well. I've been in an assessment in my local gym in Sheffield where someone was getting an assessment done with someone who wasn't a qualified tutor or assessor and they were just filming her on a phone and just saying, uh, just do this and you'll pass your assessment. Mm. Now you think about <clears throat> that, that lady gets a certificate, she goes into the sector, she's not got the right skills, knowledge, um, she's not developed any of the soft skills, any of the practical skills that are needed for, for the employers. Mm. And it's, as a sector, we need to do more about it because yeah. because I know that I've, I've spoke to some employers that have openly said, I don't care, I just need people to be on the shop floor, I just need PTs. So I don't care what certificates I've got, I don't care what the credentials are, we can deal with it afterwards, but that's a problem, it's not sustainable. And and that's that's the, this, that's a problem with the sector at the minute in terms mm -hmm. of there's low quality education, so we're setting people up to fail from, from day one and we, we, we need to address it. Yeah, it's good, but we've got, obviously got pockets of really good practice and it's good that we are moving forward in that sense. Um, and it's good to hear that operators like yourself have got this kind of detailed, kind of challenging process almost to get to get through. Going back 20 years, I, I kind of got into personal training in the sort of the, the birth of the modern era of PT. My interview was basically, would you like to personal train in this gym? And I said, yes, and I have a job. <laughs> so it's good to know that it's got a little bit more, a bit more uh, challenging since then. Um, but yeah, I think yeah, broadly speaking, we do have a bit more, a bit more work to do. Certainly, um, related to that, then um, is is diversity of talent within the, the industry a potential challenge? So, do we have enough um, kind of diverse talent when it comes to PTs? Bit of a curveball for you there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to think. Of, I'm trying to think of the workforce that we have and the people that we're coming through. Um, I, I think we do. Uh, I think there's going to. I think there's there's more positive changes in diversity now. Look at male and female. Um, our stats are going significantly more female when it was male dominated. Uh, we've had that challenge before. Um, I think diversity actually, I think we, we personally do quite well. Mm -hmm. um, at the end of the day, it's the best person for the job. Mm -hmm. But the people that are, coming, that are coming to us are very diverse. And I think that's great because, you know, health clubs, you know, we have anywhere between, you know, 6,000 and 12,000 members in any of our sites. We have to have a diverse workforce because we have a diverse number of clients um, and we've got to be able to service them. So um, from our point of view, no. Um, I just think kind of coming back to, back to your point before was we've got to set everyone up for success. Um, and it's, it's quite sad actually. I mean, we've got, I think 12, 13 applicants that have gone through a lot of our stages of interview at the moment. Um, very diverse range, the majority being female as well, which is, which is great for us at the moment to kind of balance that workforce. Um, and they're the great people, great values, we want them in our business. And we've had to say, unfortunately, the qualification is, isn't quite right. Mm -hmm. um, we're gonna have to put it on pause until we can maybe, you know, get it assessed by, by SimSpar and maybe tick a few of these boxes and do a few modules. And, and we're trying to work around that at the moment, but um, so that's difficult because there's a lot of people that want to come to our industry that we're having to say no to at the moment because yeah. uh, it's not quite right. But um, we don't see it in diversity, uh, male and female slightly, but it's going the right way. Mm -hmm. So if I say, would, is there a problem? No. Um, but is historically, yes. Are we moving in the right direction? Absolutely, yes. Um, mm -hmm. So we're confident from a total fitness point of view. Yeah, yeah. I'm, glad, I'm glad you touched on the, the, the male female issue there because the, the elephant in the room, obviously, we've got an entirely male panel here. Mm -hmm. so it's not very representative, perhaps. Um, but why, why do you think historically then there has been that shift, or that's not shift, um, bias towards males coming into the industry rather than females? And what, what's changed to, to address that balance? I, th I think we can't say safe, safe environments and safe spaces. Um, we know that the, the gym environment came from free weights, which is all male dominated, but then branched off into cardio and then studios and you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the majority of our class users are female. They're bold. It's a, safer space than, than going mm. on the gym floor. There's still that uh, gym intimidation, if you like, mm. on the gym floor. So when we look at relay in our gym floors now, we look at what does that member journey look like and does everyone feel safe within our gym floors? Um, we have female only spaces. Um, so actually we, we, we benefit from that. Um, so we can cater for everyone. Um, but I think historically we're, we've just, we're starting to change that pattern where fitness is inclusive for everyone. I think what the feedback we're getting is more females feel a lot safer within our spaces, yep. which is great. I still think we've got a lot more to do um, in terms of kind of layout spaces, that kind of thing and services uh, to make it more inclusive. Um, so we're naturally starting to see the shift when it comes to recruitment and that's from general managers, fitness managers. Um, I help on board all the fitness managers that then go on to support our PTs. Um, we've just taken on a designate role, female, very strong candidate. 
and our latest internal promotion. So our last two fitness managers have both been female. So it's great to see the demand is there yeah. uh, yeah. and it is becoming more attractive. Yeah. So yeah. so we don't see the problem, but I can see where it has stemmed from. Yeah. But I do still think we've got a bit of work to do. Uh, what about from an education perspective? Are we getting enough diversity within kind of the student base? As well? <laughs> um, again, I think when you look at, at gender, male, female, I think we're, we're moving more towards a, a positive place. Um, you know, we've, you've got that promotion of positive body image, you know, the imagery that is being used is more realistic of, of what we're, you know, people are working with, what it's like to be in the industry. Um, in terms of diversity, when you talk about ethnicity, I, I think that that's probably something that we need to, to address. I think, again, imagery needs to play a little bit more of a positive role there. Same with, with disability as well. I think there is, we need to create that safe space that, you know, people that are from a different ethnic background or people from um, a, a disability background can feel positive and confident that they are going to be able to succeed just as much as any other able-bodied or white person. Again, you know, we're an all male white panel here mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. are of a particular age, you know, and that's that's kind of what is always seen as, as wrong in the fitness industry, the leisure industry is that, um, you know, there isn't enough diversity. So we, we are moving in the right direction for that, I think. But I think we can still probably do more. I mean, Gav, probably about to tell us more about you know registrations that are coming through from mm -hmm. a qualification point of view. But I would imagine that you know having that data and being able to understand how how do we attract a more diverse workforce? What is it do do we need to do to be able to do that? And I think that that has to happen in tandem, you know, between AO provider and operator. Mm -hmm. yeah. At the risk of putting you on the spot, Kevin, then are there any, are there any stats you can give us? Uh, sorry, mate. <laughs> you put me on the spot because I don't yeah. actually have the stats. No, no. <laughs> but I completely agree. We absolutely yeah. need to do more. We have, to, we have to do more in terms of education, in terms of um, what we're discussing as well within mm. the education, the frameworks that we're developing as well in terms of around women's health. It's different to men's health and make sure that's a relevant point. And, and you're right, making people mm. feel comfortable within in the sector and, and setting them up for, for success in that way. But uh, unfortunately, I don't have the stats. <laughs> uh, okay. uh, we, we qualify around 40,000 fitness professionals per year and um, it would be really good to actually, there is someone in our business mm. that will have that data, be able to find out what that uh, what that demographic looks like. Okay, yeah. excellent. Um, well, let's move on then from recruitment onto retention. So there's various stats out there in the industry as to what the, the, the average kind of lifespan of a PT is. Uh, the one I've got down here is that 60% of PTs leave the industry within the first 12 months or so, um, which is obviously quite a, a scary statistic. Um, so let's assume that we've recruited a, a good PT, they're, they're, in, they're in the business as it were, um, what what solutions and strategies can we put in place to make sure that they are they are retained? So we know we know skills and training is important, but what's how does that formalise, as it were? You've got to get the the recruitment process right first. Yeah. <laughs> that's the that, that's the key thing. Um, we always talk about being intrinsically motivated to achieve what they need to achieve because uh, what we believe as a business, we are we aren't their managers, we're their mentors. We're helping them get to be the best PT that they can be. Um, so they have to be self-driven, self-motivated with a clear view on what they want to achieve and we help them get there. We don't do it for them. And we're very, very clear with, with that expectation. Um, in terms of onboarding itself, um, culture is a big thing. You know, understanding our gyms, understanding culture. Um, so they get fully onboarded with every single one of our products, every single one of our team members, understands how the business really runs. Uh, where do they fit within that and who can they influence when they're in the building? That's really, really important. Um, but then a quite a structured um, onboarding process. Some of the PTs coming through were actually more knowledgeable about PT than some of our fitness managers because uh, they've come from leadership backgrounds, fitness coach backgrounds, but never actually ran their own PT business. So when we acquired our existing PT business and brought it in-house, there was a skills gap there. Mm -hmm. um, we identified that. We appreciate it. Now, we have some fantastic leaders that just don't, didn't have that PT skill acumen behind them. So they're the right people. Now we need to bridge that skill gap. Um, so what we identified with, with FutureFit is we need a provider that is going to support our PTs, but it's also going to support our, uh, our middle management as well in terms of being able to get them to be the best mentors they can be to others. Um, so our education platform and ProZone, uh, we allocate all the training that we believe is important and essential uh, to get our PTs to a place where they need to be. Yeah. Um, so every single one of our fitness managers has been through the 30, 60, 90, um, induction plan that we've now created for all our PTs that come through. So that's an expectation that we set. So within their first 30 days, all the education within their first 30 days is signed off before they can unlock the next 30 days. 
essentially within those first three months, it allocates training and education towards what they should be feeling and what they should be learning as that first three months progresses. So it manages their expectation not to do everything in month one. I want to be the perfect PT in month two. It's not going to happen. So we manage their expectations. Um, that's very, very clear within those within those first three months. After those after those uh, three months, um, they then open up the whole pro zone model. So that's when they start to go, what, what interests you? What excites you? Um, but then also 50% of them, that tailored content is as a mentor, where do I think I can support you with your skills gap? This is what I've identified, but what do you really want from your journey? And then that kind of filters through to the next stage of their education. Uh, so it's a more, more broader approach, but that 30, 60, 90 days is, is essential. Yeah. Um, and actually since we've, so do have some stats. So we've got 15 sites um, and we started to rank them because now we've had the education file for close to a year. Uh, we actually ranked them with engagement with education okay. and how many graduates have they passed from our employed model who have graduated to then run their own successful self-employed business. Um, it was linear. So the, f the top five clubs that were most engaged with the education, uh, they had plus six uh, personal trainers. Uh, the middle five had a smaller amount of growth and the bottom five stayed stagnant. There was a direct correlation and we waited for a long period of time. We didn't do it after month one or month two. We waited close to a year for the education to landing club. Um, the direct correlation between successful EPTs graduating to successful self-employed business through uh, engagement with, with education. Right. So it's, it's clear it works. Yeah. yeah. That's, I think that's really important, isn't it? Because, you know, we've, we've got standards from, from the AOs. You know, we know that those vocational qualifications, they need to hit a standard. We put that through, you know, we have the case studies, we have the application of what it means to, to get those qualifications. Yeah, there's a bit of tick box in there potentially, but we want to make sure that they can apply that when they get into the, into the job, into the businesses themselves. But then is that formalized continuous education and, and that might be through a qualification of CPD or it might actually be through a mentorship program. Um, but that's really interesting to hear. That's good to hear. Yeah, yeah it's, it's really just the one thing I've just sorry, not touched on is the um, why is that mentor there if the education platform is there? Hmm. Uh, now the mentor is there for the softer skills. Mm -hmm. um, they lead uh, large businesses. They're, they're accountable for anywhere up to 36 members of the team in a single day. Um, so they run the operations of the full club uh, some days. So their, their leadership capability is great. Um, so what they can really bring to the table is the education ticks one box. But what I can give you is those softer skills, um, how to talk to people, how to deal with conflict resolution, um, how to get the best out of the individual, how to identify what their strengths are and what their blind spots might be. Hmm. Um, so I think it's really important that you have a strong, not just necessarily commercial, but people leader. Um, yeah. We lead by people, we absolutely stand, we, our business starts and ends with people. They're the kind of people that can give you those softer skills. And then we use the education provider to really give them those um, vocational skills, if you like. Yeah. yeah. So they're helping them put it all into practice, basically. And this is this is what you've learned. This is how yeah, to yeah. do it now. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm sure the, the, the application. Yeah. 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 So, so the fitness manager is there to go, okay, how are you going to use this education? Um, I have a real beam about it. I've got you going down a rabbit hole now. So the, 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 the bee in the bonnet around you know, people that listen to podcasts and listen to 10 podcasts a day and 20 audio books, does nothing with it. Yeah. Um, that, yeah, yeah, that mentor yeah. is designed to go, okay, you've learned this. Tell me what you've learned. How might that affect your business? How are you going to use that? And what does mm. it look like? Mm -hmm. Then once you've used it, what does success look like? Mm. Um, application after education and learning yeah. is so, so important. And that bit gets missed a lot. Mm. Um, I think by having that mentor there that test understanding uh, and test implementation is is absolutely key because uh, you can you can learn everything in the world and do nothing with it yep. and yeah. it's, it yeah. holds it holds yeah. no value unless that information is shared yeah, yeah. you're definitely um, right there's a, there's a, that, that is a huge gap for a lot of people like they've got all that knowledge but it's useless and it's, unless you actually yeah. apply it yeah um so yes it's good to know that, you, that there are formal processes and programs in place like that, that you've been operating and not only that but it does work as well. Yes, that's, absolutely. Uh, yeah, that's also very, very reassuring. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of other operators, Carl, then, so what, what ways can other operators take that knowledge and apply it and give access to their trainers? Yeah, I think you know, what we're trying to do is we're, we're tr trying to support all the operators to, to bring that application in. I think you know, what they're doing here at Total Fitness is, is that benchmark, isn't it, really, where we're, we're saying, here's, here's a load of education. We, we can provide you with this, but here's a way of actually bringing it to your team. Um, but it has to be the operator that does that. You know, we had a discussion earlier of it's, we're responsible for the education part, we're responsible for getting it to the people, but then it's the operator's responsibility with our help to actually put that in, in into that application process, isn't it? So I think, you know, other operators, they, they can take 
a lead from from what's happening here but it, it depends on what they they want from their model isn't it you know what we discussed earlier is it a case of do we just want pts to be there or fitness instructors to be there for, for people to be able to access and they're just left to it you know because we we want them to have that service but we're not really going to do anything with it or is it that we want to actually create a culture and i think that's that's the key isn't it for, mm. for operators what what culture do they want for their for their staff mm. do you know i've been in rooms with the sector and i've heard people have the debate like who's responsible for cpds <laughs> so is it is it the employer is it the individual themselves but i think this model of meant i mean you put it in any other sector every, every other sector has got the same problem it's about yeah. at the minute it's about retaining staff mm. and if you have other sectors like just say someone worked in finance and said it's up to them to develop themselves where, where's that person ever going to go? So I think this idea of mentoring people, making sure people are aware of where they can get the education yeah. that's needed, but they've also got the coaching that's needed for them to guide guide them through the career and support. And I think it's it's brilliant, this kind of idea of it's not our responsibility, it's your responsibility. Yeah. You're a PT, you need to go do the education yourself. But if it's not applied, as you said, what's what's the point? Mm. Yeah, yeah, it needs to be kind of like a, yeah, it's a, a, cross, uh, what's like a cross partnership between the individual, the PT, the operator also, training providers as well to kind of instill that culture of ongoing development and it's it's you, you, it doesn't stop once you've got your piece of paper you need to con consider what you're going to be doing for the, the rest of your career essentially mm -hmm. uh, again going back 20 years my initial kind of onboarding was, was a half day course and that was it right <laughs> off you go it's a miracle I got anyway really um so it's really good to see now that there are there's at least i'd say pockets of, of really good practice now that, that's starting to introduce this to the rest of the sector and hopefully that will spread uh, and, and and go wider um, I think mentorship is a really interesting one because it's, it's, it can be quite difficult to scale that to make sure that everybody's getting the same level of support. Um, but again, thanks to what the use of someone's proved itself, certainly with internal fitness, that it's, a, it's an essential part of that process. Do you, do you have a vision for where you kind of go from here to make that even better? Or are you just going to get this, get this bit right? Yeah, I think it's getting this bit right. I think we're, we're only as good as our people at the end of the day because it's people that run the platform. Mm. It's people that then check in after they've done the education. Um, if we don't get our people right, then you can have all the best education in the world and it still doesn't work. So um, I think we're getting better at what we do. Um, and what I've kind of said there sounds perfect. In reality, uh, we're probably <laughs> about 75, 80% of kind of where we should be, uh, really. And we can always do better and we're always striving for more. Um, let's walk before we can run. Um, and we've, we've shown it works. Now it's about looking at the incremental pieces to go. How can we support our PTs? But what bandwidth have we got through our fitness leaders within club to be able to make sure it happens effectively? Because yeah. we can do loads more tomorrow. Um, but in reality, how well can we do it? And it's important that when it lands, it sticks. Um, so I think it's the, the reality of how much time do we have in club? How much time do we have to invest in our PTs? And just be realistic as a business on what you think you can achieve. You know, we're not going to promise the world and then deliver. We're going to over deliver on what we say we will. Mm. Um, so I think it goes back to that. And I think an, an element along the way of um, you know, supporting our PTs and our fitness leaders in club, including our general managers and bringing our other stakeholders within club as well. Um, I think we've got a bit to do there. The one thing that we've that we've done recently, uh, which I think is great, is a bit of a kind of you say we did. Um, so some of the education um, that we've now done, which is the custom education, so specifically just for total fitness. Uh, we had our personal training summit last year, and we asked the question, if you had eight topics of education, what would be from one to 10, what would be the most in-demand education that will help your personal business move forward? So we took all the feedback from all our personal trainers in a room, they ranked them from one to 10, and we've gone out there and created all our custom content. So kind of a bit of you say we did, I think is really important. Um, so we actually launched our first one to, to today. Yeah, it went out today, uh, which is all around female fitness. So that was the, one of the biggest things in demand. So that went out first. Um, some are around lead gen um, on the gym floor, but specifically total fitness gym floors. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we know we have big spaces, we have studios, we have you know eight different ways of working out. Um, how do we optimize each one of those? So it's not generic, it's personal to total fitness. So I think we'll see how that lands. If that lands really well, which I'm sure it will, then we kind of start to see what what's next. Um, official mentorship programs, we've kind of teetered around the edge to go, we've got some amazing self-employed personal trainers out there that have done absolutely everything. Um, these guys have so much more to give. Um, so we're kind of skirting around the edges of how can we integrate that into our existing PTs? Now, a lot of them just do it anyway, off their own back, which I think is fantastic. Um, and that comes down to culture. Yeah. They want to help other people because our culture is one where everyone wants to help each other, yeah. uh, which is great. 
Um, so I think there's a little bit more to do to unlock the existing skill set that we have in our business. I think we've got a little bit more to do there. Um, how that looks, I don't know yet, but okay. long-winded answer. Yes, there's a lot yes. more to do. <laughs> um, but let's get what we do right very good first. Okay, that that's sounds like a, let's get to great. a positive note to end on. So there, there are Absolutely. solutions out there. It can work. We can re recruit and retain good PTs into the yeah. industry, um, which obviously benefits the trainer, but also organizations, employers, and ultimately the the, the gym member and the client as well, which, yeah. is, which is great. Okay, um, well, thank you very much for contributing today, guys, and thank you for everybody for watching. Um, if you'd like to subscribe to our YouTube channel, stay up to date with the latest episodes of Beyond the Talk, um, and also follow us on LinkedIn and Instagram, and where you can join the, the conversation. We will be back after Elevate 2024 for more insight into the future of the physical activity sector. <laughs>